They're coming. They're coming your way. They'll be here soon. Will you be ready? Silent Hill 2 is without a question a masterpiece. There is no doubt in my mind that it is. And before anyone brings up the awkward dialogue delivery or the bad controls or the graphics, um, whatever, in my opinion, a masterpiece does not equate perfection in all aspects. To me, a masterpiece is a piece of work that has an impact on the genre, the medium, and the people who consume the craft. I think Silent Hill 2 covers this in spades. There was no other game like it, and anybody who tries nowadays is only a pale imitator. And if you still question my definition of masterpiece, keep in mind Ocarina of Time, largely considered a masterpiece by many, was at the time questioned by some as to whether or not it is a masterpiece just because it didn't have voice acting. Job yeah, yeah, he called okay. me into his office and basically just tried to poke holes in it over and over again in a way that at the time I thought was actually really frustrating because mm -hmm. it was, you know, he was saying like, this game doesn't have voice acting. How can you say the sound's a 10? This is when we were scoring on component scores. So it was, what was this? This sound, was graphics, theme? gameplay, sound, uh, value, and reviewer's tilt. And so he just sat there and kind of poked holes like, wouldn't it be better if it had voice acting? Wouldn't it be better if it had this? And I was like, well, you know, the standards of the console, all this other stuff, like if, if these are the policies that we review by, mm. absolutely not. This is a sound 10 all the way. Uh, and he kind of grilled me on it for a while, and then at the end of it went, <clears throat> All right, if that's what you want to do, which was actually the worst thing he could have said. Like, fuck, God damn it. The way we view these mediums change, but I believe the impact they make speaks in volumes than how they age. I really adore Silent Hill 2 and I'll sing its praise forever, yet there's one aspect of the game that I truly wish to focus on, and that is the monster design. See, Silent Hill monster designs have always been stellar. Well, I mean, most of the time. Each monster has a purpose, and they aren't just made just for gameplay mechanics, or just to be creepy for creepy's sake. They were created as an antithesis of the main character, sometimes acting as a distorted mirror into the main character's psyche. In Silent Hill 2's case, it's reflective of James Sunderland. Do keep in mind that a lot of these monsters are, in a way, spoilers to Silent Hill 2's story, so I really recommend playing the game first and beating it and returning back to this game, but I'm pretty sure most of you aren't going to do that, or you've already played the game. And, well, if you don't want to, that's fine, but I just really love this game, and I think everyone should really give it a shot. Anyways, I warned you, so let's start off with the Bubblehead Nurse, possibly one of the most famous monsters in Silent Hill history, right behind Pyramid Head, and don't worry, we'll get to him soon. To back it up a bit, for those who don't know Silent Hill 2's story, it's about a man named James who had recently lost his wife Mary to an illness, or so he thought. Things changed when he received a letter from her saying she'll wait at their special place in Silent Hill. It's a very short summary, but that pretty much kicks off the whole story, and the reason you need to understand this is because James had to deal with Mary as she lay dying. When people know that they're about to die, their mood shift, they don't become themselves anymore, and they lash out at the people closest to them and hurting them the most. It's around this time that during her illness, it's believed James had an affair with Mary. Now, it's only a theory, and there's pretty much no flat-out admission of guilt, but there are the nurses and some other monsters. The nurses, aside from being very, very terrifying, are also scantily clad and rather erotically designed, and trust me, this isn't just because they're good for selling merch. It's due to how James Sunderland felt during his wife's illness. Again, it's believed that James had an affair, and what other person is there to have an affair with than the homebound nurse, who's most likely younger, more attractive, and if not that, then they're at least less sickly looking than his dying wife. People debate whether or not James slept with the nurses, and I personally believe he didn't. I just think the man really wanted to have sex with, well, pretty much with anyone, honestly. It just so happens that the nurses were readily available right there for his imagination to go gaga, and 
While it's not as fucked up as actually cheating on his dying wife, it's still a messed up thing to think about and to make anyone really feel guilty. Like that's your only thing on your mind, sex, while your like wife is dying? Come on, man. Though the outward appearance of these nurses likely contribute to how Mary looked. She's ill, sick, looking deathly pale and constantly in pain, much like the bobblehead nurses who are constantly twitching, groaning out of pain. It's it's sort of a hybrid between his wife and the real nurses. It's the main reason why the bobblehead nurses have bubble heads. They're bandaged up to look like nobody because to James, they were nobody. Just beautiful women he wishes he could be with instead of his angry, sick wife. Though, if we want to personify his wife in a more brutal, disgusting rendition, then look no further than lying figures. These are just the manifestation of Mary Sutherland. She once stated that she looked like a monster, and in a way, this is her own dark reflection of herself and how James felt about her during this time. This is the monster of terminal illness, the most corrupt form of a human dying. The way that creature has its arms restrained is symbolic of how Mary felt trapped in her own body and James's frustration of being unable to hold her or reach out to help her. The way they spit out acid could be indicative of how toxic she was towards James during her illness. It can also reflect just how much she vomited during her sickness. The zippers on their head could reflect of how James wanted his wife to just zip it up or shut up whenever she spoke so harshly towards him. Of course, not every monster is based on James's fear. Silent Hill is also a reflection of everyone's sins and fears, and the abstract daddy just so happens to be Angela's greatest demon. It's a monster that merged itself with another creature and when you look on top it almost looks like the first half of the monster is bent over on top of the other half of the creature which is constantly screaming i think we all know what this symbolizes what with the phallic mouth and the bondage between the two creatures and the agony of the body creature it's a, it it's it's very sexual looking and um yeah, even the room the monster resides in is such a huge phallic representation of what the Abstract Daddy is. I mean, it's in the name itself, Abstract Daddy. Ugh. The room is textured as if it were the inside of a womb or a uterus, and there are multiple phallic objects going in and out of the room. It's really horrifying, especially when you consider the demonetization symbolism. Fun fact, this is the only time you would have had to fought the Abstract Daddy as it was just Angela's Dark Demon. It wouldn't really have made sense if James had to fight them, yet you fight a ton of them during the last part of the game when you're in the hotel. It really makes no sense. Like, at all. When asked about this, the monster designer of the game, Masahiro Ito, said that it wasn't supposed to happen, yet when he was asked why it did happen, he just replied with, it's the game. Cool. And of course, who can forget Pyramid Head? Oh, the symbolism he carries. Obviously one of Silent Hill's most iconic characters, also one of the most overused and overmarketed to the point where he really has no meaning anymore. But that of course wasn't always the case. See, in Silent Hill 2, Pyramid Head is the very definition of James's guilt and inner turmoil. Again, if you don't want the game spoiled, this is your last chance. I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, good? Well, anyways, James fucking murders his wife and it's weighing on him so much that it burdens him and it's manifested through this massive butcher knife that he struggles to carry around but refuses to let go because it symbolizes how he really wants to fucking off himself because of all the guilt. It's also interesting to note that Pyramid Head is a sort of bizarre version of an executioner, and according to the lore, Silent Hill was a town where executioners were frequent. So frequent, in fact, that most families were either friends with executioners or had relatives as executioners. This is, of course, going back to the motif of him being a sort of reminder of James of his past guilt. He even goes so far as to abuse other monsters, both sexually and murderously. This is meant to both represent the themes of death and sex that is so heavily implied throughout the entirety of Silent Hill 2, and to show James's violent nature towards his own wife and to himself. Oh, and also there's a bunch of pyramid heads, not just one. And I'm not talking about the ones with the other Silent Hills where he's just like there for no reason. Oh God, that shit makes me sad. Now, I can go on 
and on and on and on about a lot of these monsters. And I know for a fact there are so many more that I've yet to touch and even symbolism that I haven't even mentioned yet. But I either left them out because they're just different versions of James's sexual frustration or his abuse towards his wife and vice versa or because their designs weren't really as interesting as I thought they were. That's not to say they aren't fascinating, it's just that we've got other things to cover here on Traumathon. Maybe someday I'll dive deeper into these monsters, or maybe next year I'll talk about them in length. I'll just have a whole video dedicated on every single Silent Hill monster ever, whichever comes first, I guess. In the end, the scariest monsters we have in life are our own guilts and sins, haunting us forever, never leaving us alone and always tormenting us. And that's exactly what Silent Hill personifies so well.